Okay, uh, this is Dr. Morton uh, dictating, um, uh, uh, this, uh, recording the video for the 8th, uh, Thursday, 8th of October, uh, for Micro One, uh, WE 3463. So let's take a quick look at the, uh, at the syllabus. So uh, I did change this, so just so you know, uh, the, the, the first, the, well, we, did, we already did the programming test, but this is the first uh, written test. And the idea on this one is that uh, we're just going to cover not, not so much assembly language programming. In fact, we won't cover assembly language program much at all. But what we, what we will cover are just some, some general, um, general written concepts. And uh, we'll do this test on, uh, on Monday, I mean on Tuesday, next week. Uh, it was scheduled for today. I, I'm surprised nobody was asking me about this. Um, anyway, uh, so I'm definitely not uh, ready to have you do it today because I, I do want to talk about this, uh, uh, the lab, the touch sensing lab. And we'll also throw in the A to D and D to A. So that's what we'll cover uh, 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 today. And then uh, I will, uh, I'll make sure... I'll say a few things about the, the written test at the end of this uh, um, recording. Okay, so first let's let's talk a little bit about um, the uh, A to D and the D to A. Okay, so let me first uh, talk about the A to D. Uh, we've already used it, and we're going to use it again on Friday, uh, but we didn't really explain much about it, and uh, so we'll do that. The A to D on this on this chip is a fairly um, it's a fairly rudimentary A to D, which uh, for better or for worse it makes it easier to understand, which is kind of nice actually. Uh, so uh, if we if we uh, yeah something like that. So most of the real world uh, has sensors that are analog in nature, and generally they they create a typically a signal that's a voltage. And we want to take that signal and uh, get it into the computer in a digital format so we can work with it. So how do we do that? Well, that's where a, uh, an, a an analog to digital conversion takes place. Now, generally, uh, our analog to digital converter is, uh, is, is it within a, at least a microprocessor module, but even a standalone chip, uh, has some constraints. First off, uh, the one in our chip uh, can never measure voltages lower than ground, and it can never mo measure voltages higher than the operating voltage of our chip. So if we're running our chip at 3.3 volts, the maximum voltage we can measure varies from ground to 3.3 volts. Now we can, we can modify that a little bit. We can shrink that range, but we can't make it bigger uh, unless we want to increase the operating voltage of our chip. Uh, so what do we do if, say, we're trying to uh, A to D a signal that varies, say, from minus 15 volts to plus 15 volts? Well, in that case, we'd have to condition it. And normally the way we do this is we use an operational amplifier, and uh, we set up the operational amplifier to, uh, to attenuate the signal. So now it's only going to vary over a 5-volt range, maybe minus 2.5 to plus 2.5. And then we create an, a, a DC offset of plus 2.5 volts so that now it's varying from zero, or, or uh, sorry, we should do it, uh, well, anyway, I, didn't, I did it over 5 volts, but same thing for 3 volts. We just ad we attenuate it so that it fits in a 3.3 volt range, and then we adjust the DC offset so that the, the, the minus uh, uh, 1.75 or whatever it is uh, volts would be uh, the center point uh, would, would be shifted up to ground so that now our signal never goes negative it only varies between ground and 3.3 uh, volts and then when we move it into the computer now uh, we know uh, that the the midpoint of the voltage range would represent zero volts and so we we can use that information then to uh, 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 to process our signal. Uh, so within the computer, we can let our, our digital values mean whatever we want. But in the, in the A to D hardware, 
we have to respect the the operating voltage limits that uh, that the module uh, requires. And in the case of this fairly simple uh, module, we are absolutely constrained to only varying between ground and the operating voltage, say 5 volts or 3.3 or whatever. Okay, so um, the other consideration is uh, is how fast our our analog signal is changing. Now, if our analog signal is changing, uh, at, if it has frequency components, say that are very very fast, then we may have a problem. And the the module on this chip can uh, can convert voltages uh, probably up to about uh, ten kilohertz or something like that. Uh, but once we get past that, <clears throat> we're definitely in trouble. Uh, and <clears throat> If we have a signal that's changing, that has megahertz frequency components in it, for instance, we're not going to be able to capture it with this chip. We would have to use a standalone chip, uh, and then we could we could probably move those values in fairly quickly, uh, because this this computer can execute uh, it, its clock can go up to 32 megahertz, which means we can execute uh, up to uh, eight instructions uh, per microsecond. So we could move a lot of data in, but but we wouldn't be able to do the digital conversion because the digital conversion uh, requires something about uh, 13 um, microseconds or 14, uh, yeah, 14 microseconds per conversion, something like that, and that just limits our frequency component. and And that's just the conversion. We still have to we still have to move the values around in the computer to do something useful with them, and uh, and so we could set we we could uh, we could buffer the data up using uh, say an interrupt routine, uh, but um, but our, still we're we're pretty well limited to uh, to you know a few you know maybe tens of kilohertz. All right, and the other thing is remember. Uh, the Nyquist sampling criteria: you have to sample at twice your your bandwidth or twice the highest frequency component you you have. Uh, so if you're if you're going to say have a uh, uh, 20 kilohertz signal, then you have to sample at 40 kilohertz at a minimum, and that 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 doesn't allow you to oversample and make your job filtering a little bit easier. Uh, you if you sample at the minimum sample sample at the absolute minimal sample uh, interval. Then you're then you're going to have to have a really good filter to make it this work, and that's in one of the other considerations. If you do have a signal that's coming in, uh, we generally need to low pass filter it to filter out any high frequency components that might uh, give us false information in our final values. So there's there's a lot of science to analog to digital conversion, uh, uh, and more than really was within the scope of this course. But for things that are changing slowly, uh, you know, like a temperature sensor where it's not going to change that fast, or uh, where we want to measure the, um, say, uh, the value of a potentiometer, uh, we're not going to twist the knob that fast. So for for things that are changing relatively slowly, uh, we we can use this uh, A to D converter, uh, and it's going to be very very effective. Now. To, in order to use this in our program, we we have to configure it, and so we're going to talk about what it takes to get this all configured uh, so that it, it will work for us. Um, assuming we have our signal conditioned, so it's going to vary from ground to our operating voltage, and that we have the bandwidth uh, under control so that we're not trying to sample uh, frequency components that are too high to be sampled, and you know, of course, what happens is they get folded back in, uh, so so they still show up in your data. They ju they just show up at the wrong frequencies. Um, okay, so a, an a example would be the LM35 temperature sensor. Uh, your little analog board does have a temperature sensor on it. It's not the LM35. Um, it is a microchip part. Uh, it's a it's a MCP9700, uh, I think. But it, it works in a similar way. The LM35 actually is a little nicer, and I, I sort of wish I'd gotten those and used those instead. But I, I bought a whole bunch of the other ones, and I'm kind of stuck with using them for a while. Um, these are not super expensive. They're maybe 25 $0.50 cents 
Um, I used to have a bunch of them, but uh, students burned them all out. And the way you burn them out is you just plug them in backwards, and they get super hot and they're ruined. Um, so we, so the way this works, you, uh, it, it's exactly the same as the chip we have. It's just a, uh, it, it, it's not, it, the, the, the accuracy and the calibration aren't as nice. That's the difference. Um, so anyway, you have a ground terminal, you have a, a signal that's output, uh, and you have your operating voltage. Uh, they're required to operate, uh, the, I think the MCP 9700, I think you can operate from three volts to, I don't know, maybe six or seven or something, I can't remember. But it, but it works fine at 3.3 R5 volts on our, on our, um, on our Viva board. Um, so, but we have to measure this V out, right? So how are we going to measure, how are we going to measure that voltage with our microprocessor? Well, the, the answer is we're going to have to use an analog to digital converter. Um, okay, so, so that's one example of why we need analog to digital converters. Um, and again, if the sensor requires four volts and the pick's running at 3.3 volts, then how would you connect that up? Well, you would, you would have to, uh, you'd have to go ahead and give it four volts and then you'd have to condition your, your V out by attenuating it. Uh, and generally, again, we would do that with an operational amplifier. Operational amplifiers are just wonderful devices because they, uh, they, you can, you can set them up to change, to either amplify or attenuate the signal and you can, sh you can DC shift them and you can do this all very easily with just a few resistors. Um, so, and they're, they're, they're just uh, relatively inexpensive parts as well. Okay, so here's our ADC module. That's one of the many peripheral modules we have. Here's our CPU and here's our program memory. Here's our clock generation module. Here's our random access memory, our EEPROM, our, our uh, GPIO ports, and then all the various uh, functional modules. All right, so what we have what we have to do, uh, we're, we're going to convert an analog voltage to a number of bits. Now, it absolutely is constrained to be within a defined range. And the precision, how accurately we're going to nail down that voltage, is related to the number of bits. Now, this A to D converter uh, can give us uh, 10 bits. Uh, so 10 bits means that, uh, let's say we have, uh, we're measuring a, a voltage from ground to, say, 5 volts. Well, so 10 bits basically gives us 1K, which is about 1,000, so 1,024 uh, different bins that our signal will go into. And so you can think of it as about 1,000. So that, that lets us measure it then to, uh, if we take 5 volts and divide it by 1,000, then, um, well, let's do, let's do that so I don't get a decimal point messed up. Um, so... So here's our, oops, I guess I did two of them. So if we uh, take 5 volts, 5.0, and we're going to divide that by, well, let's go ahead and do 1024, 1024. So every count is going to count for uh, 0, 0, 4, 8, 8, 2, 8, 1, 2, 5 volts. Okay, now because this is a weird number, if we want to, instead of using the 5 volts, uh, on the micro, uh, the operating voltage of the microprocessor, we can use our fixed voltage reference, and the fixed voltage reference uh, has a has an output at 1024, 2048, uh, and 4096. So we can use the 4096, and then uh, what's nice about that is, uh, if we clear this, let's say then now our voltage is varying from zero to 4096. So we take 40, uh, 4.096 and we divide that by 1024 and oh we get a nice clean 0 0.004 so that so if you really you know if you want to be a little more precise you can do that otherwise you're probably going to have to round a little bit so uh, 0 0.004 now in our in in our case we don't really care uh, we're we're just we're just going to use the pot to set a level and we're going to look at the level uh, through uh, on our computer screen, and we'll just set it to whatever we want it to be, and so that that'll be rather nice. And 
but if you if you want to make it a little nicer you can use your fixed voltage reference and have your positive reference be a power of 2 which gives you a little cleaner measurement uh, if you're running at 3.3 volts then you'd have to use 2048 uh, but the same thing and so uh, so and that that'll give you well so 20 20 uh, sorry clear uh, so uh, then we would use 2.048 uh, sorry 4 8 divided by 1024 and that gives us 0 0.002 volts per count so you take your count you multiply it by 0 0.002 and that tells you uh, the voltage that you measured assuming that uh, you did everything correctly okay so sometimes you do want to use the fixed voltage reference for your analog volt positive voltage reference you can also change the negative reference again you can't go lower than ground but you could go up from there and sometimes we'll do that by using an external pin uh, so there are different things you can do uh, you can change the positive reference by using an external pin too and those are all things you have to set up with the configuration registers all right all right so um, all right now there are a whole bunch of different technologies used to do analog to digital conversion but most microprocessors use what's called successive approximation register or a SAR now the way the SAR works uh, it it uh, well, yeah, I was going to show a little demo. Yeah, let me, we'll, I'll, I'll put this on. And so I'll, I'll go ahead and do a little demo first. So let me do this. I'm going to, I'm going to blow this up and I'm going to let you see. Uh, well, you know what? Actually, what I need you to, what I need to do is have you see the screen. So let me shrink this back down and I'm going to bring my, yeah. So I'm going to bring, here's my, here's my putty. So this is my output. My my device is running right now uh, and I've already I've scaled it by one digit but I'll just show you I'm gonna take the pot and I'm gonna ro rotate it and if I rotate it all the way down here uh, I get 3 FF which is basically 1024 if you will uh, but I've uh, added a I've shifted it four bits just to make it work correctly so you can ignore that last zero and uh, and then if I turn it all the way the other way, we go down to almost zero, not quite, doesn't quite get to zero. Uh, but if I if I grounded that, that analog pin, it would be zero. Now what I'm actually doing, uh, I'll show you. Uh, oh, now I will change this and I'll switch the camera so you can see. So so here's my here's my little pot right here. You can see this little this little blue uh, knob that's right there. Let me get that scaled over and I'll move it over a little bit. Maybe I'll even make it bigger. Well, what the heck, we'll just make it all the way big. So you can see I'm changing this little knob and and I'm just going to hold it and turn the knob and then you can see the, uh, the values change over here. So from well, almost got a zero there all the way up to uh, 3FF0. Now, remember, I, I shifted it four bits just so I, I could, uh, just, sh just so I could um, uh, use it for the threshold because our, our threshold is being generated by a 16-bit counter. So our threshold is, our, our, our T count goes from, could theoretically go from zero to 65K, uh, but uh, so I, it doesn't ever get up that high. It only gets up to, uh, this is running in about uh, 1.6 BB or something like that, 1.6 something something in hex. So I, I need, need my threshold to get up close to that. And the way it's set now, it goes up to that. And I found that if I set my threshold at about 1024, it works pretty well. So I'll just drop it down so it's back down somewhere in the, you know, yeah, somewhere in the, 1000 range okay something like that all right uh, let me switch this back and then I'm going to move myself back over here and okay now all right so you can see uh, 
so these are the values coming out. And this is one of the really nice things about your CR2102 dongle uh, because you can, your board can uh, display this information uh, on your computer and that makes it really nice. Okay, I'm going to put this back over here for now. All right. Now, um, so on our chip, our 1829, we have 12 analog input channels, potentially. Now, some of them are already tied up. Uh, RA0 and RA1 are we're using for our, uh, for our SNAP uh, debugger, uh, programmer debugger header. Uh, so we don't really have those available. We could, but we but we kind of we're, we're not we don't we're not desperate for additional analog channels, so we're so we're we're not using them. And then there's some internal channels that you can also connect to your A to D converter that uh, don't have external pins at all. They just connect internally. And one of those is an internal temperature sensing. So you you do have a temperature sensor built in your chip, uh, and you can connect that up to your A to D converter and read the temperature on your on your uh, silicon die of your chip. You also can read the output of your digital to analog converter, uh, and you can also read the output of the fixed voltage reference. So those are things you can do. Uh, there are some, uh, there's several dedicated special function registers associated with, uh, with the A to D converter. First we have the, uh, the, uh, the A to D control register uh, one and uh, it, it's actually 0 and 1. I don't know why I said 1 and 2. Then you have the result registers, ADRES, high, and low. So that's where you get your 10-bit results. And you can set it up. You can write justify it, which puts the lower 8 bits in the low register and the upper 2 bits of the 10-bit result in the upper, in the high register. Or you can left justify it, which puts the upper 8 bits in the high and the lower 2 bits in the upper 2 bits of the low register. Uh, there's reasons why you might want to do one or the other. Generally, when we use it with assembly language, we may only use eight of the bits, in which case we'll left justify it and just use the ADRS H. But when we're working in C, we usually right justify it, and then we add the low register to the high register shifted eight bits uh, to the left, and that gives us a, well, it gives us a 16-bit result, but but again, there's only 10 bits uh, that are filled. So our biggest number would be 1024, or 3FF in hex. And then you have your AND cell registers for A, B, and C. These by default are always set up to be in analog mode. So if you don't change them and clear them to use them for digital purposes, they'll be all set for your analog function. However, if you clear them, then, uh, then you cannot use uh, any of those pins where the AND cell bits cleared for an analog input, they just won't work. Uh, so you have to make sure you, so you always need to double check those AND cell bits. For digital, you want to check to make sure they're cleared. For analog, you want to check to make sure they're still set to a 1. And uh, even though that is the default, uh, you, you're, it's very wise to check that. And then there's a few other registers that are involved for interrupts. Uh, the TRIS register that all these bits need to be set as inputs. If they're not, you are outputting the result of your uh, flip-flop associated with that pin onto the pin. So if you're trying to read in, you know, say two volts and your flip-flop is set low to ground, you're going to basically short your pin out. So that's not going to work very well. So you, you must have it, the TRIS bit must be set, just like the ANSEL bit. Um, and then, uh, and then for uh, some of these uh, the these other bits, we do need to uh, we do need to if we're going to use interrupts, uh, we need, we have to have all these things set up correctly. Okay, so we have to configure our port, which means ANSEL bit set, TRIS bit set. Uh, we have to select the right channel using one of the configuration registers. We have to configure our voltage set references. So for our purposes, we're just going to use ground VSS and our operating voltage of our microprocessor VDD. So VDD and ground. You have to select what your clock that's going to drive this module is going to be. Normally we do use the system clock, and we, we, but we have to make sure if it's running pretty fast that it's not running too fast 
uh, we have to slow it down so it's about 1 megahertz. In our case, we will use FOS divided by 4, and at 4 megahertz, that will give us a 1 megahertz clock, and that's as, that's as fast a clock as you're allowed to have. And then uh, set up all your interrupts, and, uh, and then make sure your two result registers are either formatted right justified or left justified, depending. Normally, when we're programming in C, we normally like to right justify it. Okay, uh, here's the A to D block diagram. So you'll notice a couple of things. You'll notice that you have the there are 12 potential inputs for your uh, A to D converter. And then you have this multiplexer here. There's also three, three internal uh, uh, connections you can make. And you do that by setting the, the, the five channel selection bits that are located in ADCON 0. Uh, so we do have to set that up. And then we also have to set up ADCON 1 correctly so that our positive and negative references are correctly set. Now we only have two choices for our negative reference. One choice is ground, chip ground, which is VSS. The other choice is pin uh, RA0. Now, since we're using RA0 with our uh, snap programmer debugger, we didn't really want to mess with it, but you could have this set up to be some other value. It cannot be lower than ground, though. So you, you can raise it, but you can't lower it. Um, okay. And so we're going to just leave this set for chip ground. And then the other, the positive reference, you have three choices. Our, our chip voltage, VDD, this, uh, the fixed voltage reference, which I mentioned earlier, which is always powers of 2, 1024, 2048, uh, and 4096. That's helpful if you want to make your scaling a little easier. Uh, or your chip reference. In our case, we don't really, we don't care about scaling this. We're just going to use the chip reference. Uh, and we're, we're just going to turn the knob and get a number. And we don't, we're not trying to measure a voltage accurately or something. All right. So remember this multiplexer here is an analog multiplexer. It's not a digital multiplexer. Uh, if you, you, whatever the voltage you put in here, yeah, that's the voltage you get out. So it doesn't have to be zero for a one and say five volts for for uh, or five volts for a one and zero for for a zero or ground for a zero. It can be it, it can it can vary over the entire range from ground to our VDD reference or whatever we've chosen as our positive and negative references. Again, it can never go lower than ground VSS. It can never go higher than VDD, but you can shrink it into a smaller range if you want by using uh, external references or on the positive side by using the fixed voltage reference. Okay, so so we're going to use uh, our potentiometer is actually coming in on pin AN11, analog 11, and that pin is, called, is actually the RB5 pin. Now how do you know uh, what pin to use? Well, that's where we, um, that's where we uh, have to look at our data sheet. So if we pop this over here and we look at the data sheet, uh, we can see uh, that, let's see if we can do, do this. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'll make it bigger. Make me that. So our data sheet then, um, we go up here uh, to to the block diagram, to this, this page. It's like page six. It's always one you want to look at a lot. This is for our 20 pin device. So that's our our, our PIC 16F RLF 1829, not the 25. And then we have to pick the right, uh, uh, the right uh, um, uh, uh, package. In this case, it's it's the SOIC, not the QFN or the JQFN or whatever it is or the UQFN. It's it's the it's the SOIC. So, and then what pin? Well, so. Uh, it's it's AN11. Uh, let's see. So where is AN11? Oh, right here. AN11 RB5. So son of a gun, AN11 and RB5 are exactly the same. Now we printed that out. Uh, we printed that out here. You can see that on our little on our little chip, on our little uh, Viva board, I should say. Uh, if I pull this up, you can maybe see. 
That's a little harder to read there. Let me, we, uh, your chip is, I think, a little easier to read. It, it, what it says, if you look, it says RB5 and AN11 right there over my thumb. And this is the analog header. That's the five pin header. Okay. So you can always look on your on your header and, and see what, what it is. Okay. Now, um, oops. All right. So now we're getting rid of the data sheet. And, um, and uh, so what happens then is we'll, we'll put this correct value in here to configure this register. Now, I guess we need to go look at the data sheet again. So our, our, um, oh, I, no, I didn't kill it. It's right, it's right here. Yeah. Okay. So if we go down to our A to D converter, uh, and I usually go to the one after it and then back up because it's a lot easier to get the stuff that way. Here's all the registers that we might have to think about. The two main ones to configure it are the ADCON0 and ADCON1. So let's look at ADCON0 first. So this is our channel selection. We want AN11. So it turns out that we that the first bit, 7, is not used. And then our next five bits are the channel select. And we want those bits to be 0, 1, 0, 1, 1. So 0, 1, 0, 1, 1. So the first, so if we're, we, we just have to translate this into a couple of hex digits, or we can leave it in binary if, if we want. And that's fine. OK, so. Uh, so we put that in here. So usually we just make this a zero. So zero, zero, uh, one, zero, one, one. And then this go done bit, uh, when you configure this register, you're, you, can, you cannot set the go done bit at the same time. You have to set that later because uh, we always have to give a little bit of time when we change the channel for the capacitor, the, the sampling capacitor to charge up before we set the go down bit. Uh, and so the data sheet specifically says you cannot change the channel number and set the go down bit in the same command because that, that's not going to work. You need to have a little bit of time uh, once you set the channel number, let the capacitor charge up, and then you can start the conversion. Because as soon as you start the conversion, it disconnects the sampling capacitor from your channel, from your signal. And uh, connects it to your successive approximation register, and that's when you start the conversion. You do have to turn on this AD on bit. So, so the value we have to put in here then is going to be uh, uh, 0, 0, 1, 0, so that's 2 hex, 1, 1, 0, 1, which is D. So 2D is what goes in there. And, uh, and that'll select channel 11, which is happens to be the channel that our analog board with the pot, it comes in on AN11. So, uh, so that'll get our pot. Okay. Now, the other thing we have to configure, we've already talked about, we have to f put a 1 here for right justifying our result. Uh, and that's what we want to do when we're working in C. Then our, then our, um, our clock source then is the AD clock source, ADCS. And we want FOS divided by 4, so that's 1 zero zero so basically then that's going to be one one zero zero rc this is a zero it's unimplemented our analog reference is the chip ground vss so that's a zero and our positive reference is also zero zero connected to vdd so so this is going to be c zero that's what we have to put in there um, okay so that configures our two registers c zero and 2D. Okay, those are the two values, and uh, that's how we get those. All right, and then, uh, sorry. So now what happens is there's a little uh, sampling capacitor here that I'm not showing you, uh, and when you when you change this channel number, that capacitor is connected then to this pin. And there's a signal coming in on pin, say in our case, pin 11, the pot signal. So the capacitor has to charge up to that voltage. And then when you start the go done bit, it disconnects that capacitor. And it's a very low value capacitor, so it charges quickly. Uh, we disconnect it from the 
from the, the pin through the multiplexer. We disconnect it here and we leave it connected to our ADC. And so inside the ADC now, we go through what's called the successive approximation register. And I think somewhere I have that. And then this just turns on the device. That's our AD on bit. And this is just our, our justification bit. Right justification is what we would pick. So we get the 10 bit result gets put in these two 8 bit re registers the lower 8 bits here and the upper 2 bits in this upper 8 bit register. And so we shift this one 8 bits and then add them together to get our 10 bit result. And then I shift it again another 4 bits in this particular case because we need to compare it to a full 16 bit register. Uh, and we want to get high enough numbers that we can set the threshold where we want to. So that's why I shifted another another hex digit, basically. Okay, so uh, so we get a 10-bit result, um, and then if we wanted to, we could change our channel number and and pick another device and read it, and we can multiplex through just like we can multiplex through our touch our touch uh, pads. We can multiplex through different input channels, but we only have one converter. So uh, if we're using several channels then that reduces the maximum frequencies that we can read because now we're, we're, we can't sample as fast as we could if we're only sampling one channel because we have to, if we're sampling three channels, then we would have to uh, sample this one every third time, which would cut our sample rate by, by two thirds or it would be one third of our maximum rate. All right. So um, now we'll talk a little bit about how this uh, successive approximation register works. So there's a clock that, that drives this. And this is, this is our, in our, in our particular case, we're running our chip at four megahertz. So we can use uh, FOS divided by four, and that'll give us a one microsecond clock. Uh, and that will work fine. Uh, so what, what happens here, we have a, within this uh, successive, um, well, Within this uh, this successive approximation register, we have this digital to analog converter. So we're actually using a digital to analog converter to do our analog to digital conversion. Kind of interesting, right? And and this is 10 bits, so that's why we have 10 bits of resolution. Now here's the way it works. So we have we have this little capacitor right here, charges up, and it holds the voltage of our signal. Now, it's connected to this comparator. Now, this comparator has a very high input impedance, so it, it doesn't draw almost zero current. Uh, and since it draws almost zero current, we don't bleed off this capacitor. Uh, so this capacitor basically is following our signal as it goes up and down and up and down in its voltage. And when we start the go done bit, it disconnects it from the signal and leaves it connected to the comparator. And then what it's doing, it's presenting a voltage on our positive comparator input pin here. Our, our, our digital analog converter here is also sending out a voltage on the, to the comparator. Now, what we do is the very first time, let's say we're running the chip at five volts, okay? And, and let's say our, our actual input is, is say three volts. So what happens is we, we take this, this successive approximation register, this SAR, we clear all the bits, and we start by setting the, the high order bit. The high order bit and all the other bits are zero. So in this case, it's a 10-bit SAR, so we have bits zero through nine. So bit nine is one, bits eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one, zero are zeros. So this, this then generate, this converts that digital value, which would be uh, 512, into a voltage. Since our voltage reference is 5 volts, and this is exactly half of the voltage range, that output voltage that goes to the comparator should be 2.5 volts. So the comparator sees 2.5 volts from the DAC, but it sees 3 volts from our capacitor that was sampling the signal, but now it's disconnected. So that 3 volts compared to the 2.5 it says that this output of the DAC is low. So what it does, it leaves that high order bit set and it sets the next bit. Now the next bit uh, is gonna contribute not 2.5 volts, but it's gonna add another 
1.25 for a total of 3.75 uh, uh, voltage, a uh, 3.75 volts. Now our input voltage is 3, so now it's going to compare 3.75 to 3 and it's going to say, ah, our DAC is higher. So since the DAC is higher, it's going to clear that bit, still leave the higher order bit set, but the next bit down, bit 8, is going to be cleared, and then it's going to set bit 7. Now bit 7 is going to add to the 2.5 volts we get from the higher order bit, it's, and, 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 uh, and we had a 1.25 here. Now that's going to get, uh, that's going to be half of 1.25, uh, which is, uh, um, I don't know, uh, so uh, 0.65, or no, 0.6, uh, yeah, 0.625. So 0.625 volts. So you add 0.625 volts plus 2.5 volts, and you get 3.1 something. Now you compare that 3.1 something to the 3 volts. It's high, so you turn off the 8, you turn off bit 7 as well, and you set bit 6, and you keep going. And you leave the bits either on or off, depending on whether they show high or low. And when you're all done, you have the last bit, and if it's high, you turn it off. If it's low, you leave it on, and that's your plus or minus 1 bit, 10 bit result. Now we know that we know that last bit it's it's rounded correctly, but it but it's it's not going to be exact, right? But by the time we get to the last bit, we're down to uh, when we use that calculator and measured it, we're down to a very you know 0 .004 uh, four something volts. So it's a it's a fairly small voltage, uh, and so that gives us our accuracy point. It's roughly we're accurate to plus or minus 0 0.004 volts, which isn't bad, okay? And that would be over a, that would be over a, 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 a 4.08 range, or almost 5. 5 would be a little bigger. Okay, so that's how this works. And it's uh, kind of interesting. All right, so now um, we'll do this. So, yeah, so this just explains it. And I think I kind of went through that so you sh that I think we've done this all right now configuring it so we always have to uh, we always have to configure our ports so we we have 12 different pins we can choose from now in our particular case we've we've made a lot of those choices for you now you you should remember if you uh, go on blackboard and you go into the pick labs there's a sheet at the top uh, that looks like this and this tells you all the pin assignments it's called uh, pin assignments on the Viva board revision 4 and this tells you all the pin and if you look here are the touch pads the touch pads use RA47 RC1 and R, uh, RA4 RC7 RC1 and RC0 now our analog header uses RC2 RC3 and RB5 and our UART uses RC4 and RC5 and our header uses RA0, RA1, and RC3, the master clear pin, or sorry, RA3, and power and ground, and so forth. Uh, the LEDs are RA5, RC6, and RA2. Our I2C port's set up with this. Our PWMs are these choices, and you can pick this one based on the a APF con. Uh, and so, so we've really spent a lot of time um, uh, trying to uh, choose these things so that they give us maximum flexibility, uh, maximum utility with our chip. Uh, but obviously, if you were starting from scratch, then you, could, you, wouldn't, you wouldn't have certain things already connected to touchpads. You could, you could do it however you wanted. And you could have as many as 12 touchpads, theoretically. Um, okay, and then the push button, RB7, I forgot that. Okay, so anyway, so you can use this to see where those pins are, and these are our, our four touchpad pins. And this is these could be analog inputs, but they, but they're, uh, but in our case, we're going to use them as capacitive touch sensing inputs. All right. Now, um, so we do our channel selection, we do our ADC voltage reference, our conversion clock. In this case, FOS divided by four. And then if we're going to use interrupts and result formatting. And we configure all that. And then uh, here are the various ANCEL registers. Now, ANCEL A, ANCEL B, and ANCEL C, there's, there's 
uh, a bit for uh, RA4, 2, 1, and 0. In, R, in on cell B, there's only uh, analog possibilities on RB4 and RB5. And on C, uh, 0, 1, 2, 3, 6, and 7. There is no analog function on RC4 and 5, 4, R5. And there's no uh, analog function on RB6 uh, and 7. Uh, and there's no analog function on RA5. And obviously the master clear input RA3. Okay. Um, okay. Uh, so, so not every pin has an analog function, but the ones that do will have an ANCEL bit, which must be set to use the analog function. That's true for touch sensing. It's true for A to D and so forth. Um, okay. Here's the, here's the conversion time. I, we don't want to spend a lot of time on this, but we're, our ADC clock source 4 megahertz. That's what we're running the clock at. And if we use FOS divided by 4, that gives us a 1 microsecond clock. And it turns out the grayed out parts uh, up here, the clock's too fast and it's the A to D conversion is not going to work right. Down here, it's saying the clock could be faster. It, it's it's still going to work right, but but it, you you uh, but you but you're taking a little more time than you really need, so you could speed up your clock if you wanted. And then the optimum range is right in here, somewhere between one microsecond and four microseconds is recommended. And we're going to run at one microsecond, which is as fast as you can run. Okay, um, so. Here's how the conversion works. Now remember, I kind of explained it when we looked at the at the at, at the SAR uh, block diagram, but here's really what happens, and it's based on uh, this this uh, FOS divided by four clock that's driving our A to D module, and so we start here at uh, at 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 the beginning of our uh, conversion time uh, T uh, cycle, I guess. So we set the go bit. And the holding capacitor is disconnected from the analog input in about 100 nanoseconds. Now, 100 nanoseconds is not long enough for that capacitor to be sure and charge up to the voltage that's on the input pin. So, because because uh, because you can't guarantee that, then uh, you you have to you if you're going to change the channel, you can't set the go done bit at the same time you change the channel. You you you. You 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 have to uh, you have to wait a little bit, okay? So uh, and maybe I don't know maybe a millisecond's fine, but you can't do it. And if you, you, 100 nanoseconds isn't long enough, a millisecond's fine probably. Uh, and then that's when the that's when the uh, the A to D conversion begins. And so then you have your first clock which gets bit nine, your next clock that gets bit eight, next clock gets bit seven. Bit six, five, four, three, two, one, and finally bit zero. That's your ten bits. And then when that happens, you've used up eleven clock cycles of your clock. And in, in our case, it's running at one microsecond, so that's eleven microseconds. And then on the next cycle, it the ADRSH high and ADRS ADRS low are loaded, and the go bit is cleared, which now alerts you. Uh, either generates an interrupt if you've set that up, or if you're just watching that bit, now you can go read the result. Now, in, in this routine today, we're going to read the result. Uh, we're going to pull on the on the go down bit, and once it's cleared, we're going to go read the result. All right, and we're going to format it. We're doing the we're setting our format bit to a one, which is what we typically do when we're using C. And the lower eight bits is down here in ADRSA or ADRSL, and our upper two bits are in ADRSH. Now we're going to shift these whole things four bits. So now we're actually going to go one, two, three, four. So we're actually going to shift the result up here. And the reason for that is we, we're going to compare it to a six to a full 16-bit register uh, using timer one. And uh, and we happen to know that that uh, we don't have any values that that max out here at FF, FF, uh, they maxed out at about, well, you can, it, you can see right here. Uh, we're, we're, we're putting out what our count is in an untouched touchpad. In, in fact, this is the U. So we're printing out what the U reads in our current setup 
when it's not touched. Now, look what happens when I touch it. You see how the count dropped way down? It dropped from somewhere around 1.6 something uh, all the way down to uh, DD something or C something. So, uh, so that's why we need our threshold to be able to get up that high. And if we didn't shift it, the maximum value this threshold would, would have would be uh, a 0, 3 FF. And that, that wouldn't be high enough to get up to, to make a nice uh, differentiation. So, so that's why we had to shift it another 4 bits. We could have multiplied it. Uh, we didn't have to shift it. But shifting is much faster if you're shifting by powers of 2, if you're, if you're multiplying by powers of 2. So rather than multiply by 16, I just shifted it 4 bits. Okay, and then here's an assembly language routine. We're not going to go over this, uh, but um, here's the A to D procedure. You basically configure the port, configure the module, configure the interrupt if you're going to use it, set the channel, and then you're going to wait the required acquisition time, start the conversion by setting the go done bit, wait for the A to D conversion to complete by either polling on the go done bit or waiting for an interrupt, and then read the A to D result, and then clear the interrupt flag if you use that. Um, and it, this is one of the rare cases where uh, if you're pulling on the go done bit, it is automatically cleared by the software and you're gonna set it when you start the next conversion so you don't ever have to clear that bit. But the interrupt flag you do have to clear uh, if you're using the interrupt flag. You could use that too uh, as well as the go done bit. But the go done bit is nicer because you don't have to clear it. Okay, and uh, and these are the registers. We've already pretty well gone through these. Uh, and here's what that input pin. And this is, this is, so our, this is the actual sample and hold capacitor. It's a 10 picofarad capacitor. This is the sampling switch. So when when you uh, push when you set the go done bit in 100 nanoseconds, this switch opens. So you probably won't get this. Uh, uh, you probably won't get this charged up to the input pin value. Now there, there are some other considerations you do have to keep in mind on this. Uh, one of them is uh, you do you have to know there's some parasitic capacitance on the input pin. There is a little bit of current that flows. There is some internal resistance that can change the value a little bit. Uh, you also have these uh, uh, protection diodes which are on every pin and you have a little bit of leakage current and um, and uh, you do have to worry about uh, the the total uh, external resistance of your signal. So if you're if you have a very high impedance uh, signal input, uh, then y y you you might need more time than uh, than the recommended time. And uh, so anyway. Uh, and this is the resistance of the sampling switch. It varies based on uh, on the voltage that you're running your chip at. So, um, so that's another variable. So there. So if you want to get into the weeds, you can. And in some critical cases, you might have to really think through all this information and see if you're really sampling, if you can sample a signal uh, fast enough with the internal A to D converter, or if you need to, uh, um, or if you need to use an external chip or do something else. The maximum recommended impedance for analog sources is 10 kilo ohms. So, uh, so if, 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 you're, if your source is higher impedance than this, you know, it's, it's, this effective resistance here is more than 10K, then, you, then, you, then you, it's going to cause problems with your leakage current. Okay, um, so uh, we talked about the right justification. Uh, we talked about we've talked about these registers already, uh, and we've talked about that was a little example. There's some sample code in assembly, um, and we've been through this already, I think. All right, so um, okay, let me just say a few things about uh, D to A conversion, uh, and then I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, I'll, I'll demonstrate the the lab, and then we'll talk about the test a little bit. Okay, so uh, D to A conversion. Well, so first off. The unlike our analog to digital converter where we have a 10-bit um, uh, resolution, that this 
this is only five bits. So you only have 32 different levels. So you, you have an input signal and it's going to get converted, an input digital value. That input digital value is going to get converted into one of 32 voltage levels. So if you're using uh, if you're using the VDD, you get to select whether you're going to use your fixed voltage reference, an external PN, or VDD. If you use VDD, say at 5 volts, then you have 32 voltage levels between zero, between ground and 5 volts. And you, you don't get a pick in between those. Now, this would not give you uh, super high fidelity uh, when it comes to uh, turning this into audio, uh, but it but you would be able to get uh, a you know s minimally intelligible audio out of it I think, uh, but again the frequencies are really limited. Once you go past a couple of k, you're probably going to have a lot of distortion. The way this works is basically just a resistance ladder. Uh, it's got a bunch of equal value resistances and an analog multiplexer and you just connect the right resistor to generate one of 32 different outputs voltages. So you have a 5-bit signal for your uh, analog multiplexer. And again, analog multiplexer, not a digital multiplexer. Uh, uh, a digital multiplexer would always give you a, either a 1 or a 0 out, but this gives you a voltage. And uh, you have to be very, very careful when you use this, this output uh, through an external pin to do something with it before you do anything with it at all. You have to buffer it with something like an operational amplifier that has a very high input impedance, draws almost no current. Because the problem is if you draw very much current through this resistor ladder where you tap it, you screw up the value, you screw up the division and it's no longer a perfect division and so you you, you'll, you'll, you'll change your voltage that's coming out. If you draw a little bit of current through it, it'll drop. And so you have to be careful with that. So you, so you, so you always must buffer with an operational amplifier your output signal before you use it for anything uh, particularly meaningful. Now, some, some, some of these PIC chips in this family have built-in uh, uh, built uh, operational amplifiers, and you can, you can use one of those to uh, buffer this output in some of those cases, but uh, but most of the time, if you don't have that, you're going to have to use an external part to do that. All right, and uh, this is so it it generates an out analog an output analog signal, but it's only five bits of resolution, and you must buffer it using an op amp, and it can be a zero gain op amp. That's perfect. You do that. That's all you do. You just take the output, connect it to the negative drive the positive with this and that'll buffer it very nicely. The input impedance here is almost infinite so almost no current is drawn and therefore uh, you don't perturb the, uh, the, 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 the working of the resistor ladder because if you draw current through it you do screw the, up the resistor ladder. But then you, now you have a buffered signal and you can, you can drive whatever you want with that and if you need big power then you might have to put another amplifier in or something. But Okay. All right, so that's all I wanted to say about the uh, A to D converter. So I'm gonna I'm gonna get rid of this, and then um, so I'm gonna change this around a little bit. Well, let me pull up the so so here's just to go through the program. So uh, a couple things. So if we download the data sheet, uh, I think I have it. Is that, do I have it right here? Uh, I guess I have it here. Yeah. Okay. So here's our here's our data sheet. I did make some changes in it. So if you've looked at it, you should download again. I, I haven't uploaded this yet, but I will. Uh, we have we we're going to use our our Viva board, the Snap programmer. Uh, you need a power supply. Nine volt battery would be nice. You can power it with the CR twenty one hundred two board. Um, so if you want to do that, that's fine. Um, and you're going to have your USB to TTL CR twenty one hundred two. And you're going to have your analog uh, plug-in board with the temp, the pot, and the photoresistor. We're only going to use the pot. Uh, we're not going to use the other two, but they they are connected to those pins, so you, you don't want to you don't want to do anything with those pins. Um, okay, and let's see. Um, so we're going to use the uh, XC8 tool chain, uh, and 
here are our four channels. Uh, so we have our, our letters, our UTSA letters are connected to RA4, RC7, RC1, and RC0. Uh, and that is what that sheet shows, I'm pretty sure, right? Let me just triple check that. Let's see. Uh, yeah, RC7, 1, and 0. Yeah, right. And RA4. Okay. And then, so, uh, the way, when, when you write the second part of the code to scan all, initially, we're just going to read RA4, the U. Uh, but later on, you can modify your code so you can read all four pins. You can scan them uh, about, uh, about um, 240 some times a second. You can scan through these. Uh, or you can scan you can scan it 240 times a second so that works out to be about 16 times a second you scan each one of these or something like that the numbers are in this sheet and and uh, if you program it the way we recommend then you'll have a little variable that tells you which 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 one was touched uh, or which one was the last one touched I guess really uh, and then there's a little routine we're going to call and we're going to change uh, we're going to we're going to change the uh, how the LEDs blink based on this. All right, so here's the setup. And again, make when you plug in your CR2102 board, if you if you do have uh, some of you have uh, a board that let me show it to you. Some of you have a, uh, a the, the 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 parts mounted. Let's see where is it. Some of you have the part mounted so it looks like that, and it has to go in. So if you have that, the way your board's going to look is it's going to it's going to face like this. It's going to stick up, and the face of it is going to is going to mount back to the towards your chip, and the other side, the blank part faces that way. Now, if you look at these parts, you can see that on the board we do have we do have on the CR2102, this may not focus this close, probably won't, but you can see the, the pin, the pinouts are listed right here, and they're also listed on the, on the CR2102. Make sure you match the pins. If you plug it in backwards, you'll burn it out. Now, if you have it mounted the other way, then it's a little harder to screw that up, because you can see uh, if you mount it the other way, then the, the board kind of lays flat and and it sort of looks uh, it looks great you can see it lying down flat but if you have it set up the wrong way then uh, then what happens it's got to be mounted in like this and and, uh, and anyway it, it's it looks kind of screwy so you have to be careful because it sticks straight up so you don't want to you don't want to mess that up it will destroy the CR2102 if you plug it in backwards. Now, if you want to power it, so you can disconnect the power, and you can power it from the CR2102 by switching your switch down. And now the board will run just fine. And you can still select between 3.3 and 5 volts because this, this little CR2102 has both voltages on it. Although the... Uh, the 3.1, the 3.3 volts is not very accurate. It's kind of screwed up. All right, but I'm going to run it on this just because it's, and even, and even when you turn the switch off, you notice there's still, uh, there's still some power getting to the chip. Uh, and you can see the LEDs on kind of slightly glowing. Uh, it actually puts in enough power through one of the pins to sort of halfway run the chip, which is crazy. But that, so, so you shouldn't leave it powered up with, in the, in the battery position with this power plugged into your desktop. Just unplug everything and then you'll be safe. Okay, so so here's what it looks like. And, uh, okay, and so, uh, so you have to connect connect up your snap, connect up your CR2102, make sure you plug it in correctly. Um, this kind of explains all that. You can even use, uh, if you want to use your iPhone or your Android phone, you can use, uh, we do have Bluetooth uh, adapters in the, in the lab that you can use, and you can actually transmit it to your, to your phone uh, uh, instead of to your desktop or laptop, if you really want. But we're going to use this, uh, uh, we're going to use this program called PuTTY, and this PuTTY sets up a terminal program. Now, that's what I showed earlier. 
uh, I showed that little putty program and and here here it is this is what it looks like and you can see it's it's just continuing to send this information out through the through the UART uh, sending it out to my desktop and uh, again whenever I touch the U you can see the the numbers change and whenever I change my pot you can see the uh, you can see the numbers over there change and it changes my threshold like I said I like to run it just about a thousand but you can also you can mess with that all right and what we're going to use the threshold for is is to detect when we consider a touch and if you look you'll see the green light is on when it's not touched and when it's touched the green light goes off off on off on it's it, it's being slowed down because of this print output the print output really drags it down if we uh, disconnected that then you would see it run a lot faster uh, I probably can do that without screwing it up too bad let's see if I can do that so, so now You can see, yeah, it's a, it's a little faster. This does slow it down, unfortunately. All right. Yeah, okay. Now, to set up the putty program, I'm gonna, I'm gonna kill this and I'm gonna come back and hopefully I can get it set up again. So we bring up putty and it looks like this and you click on the serial button and then you click here and you space over and you put in the port. Now if you don't know the port, then you have to go down here and you have to you have to right click and go up and uh, device manager and uh, it's going to bring up the device manager screen eventually. And then you if you don't see the port down here, common LPT, then you have to go under view, show hidden devices. You have to click that. And then you and then you click this and notice Silicon Lab CP twenty one oh as X, a USB to UART bridge. Uh, I guess it actually is CP, not CR. I don't know. Uh, I'm confused about that. But anyway, COM7. So since it's COM7, I click on serial and I put in COM7. And then I click this and uh, boom, there we go. And it comes up and starts running. And that's it. So that's all there to it. If you have problems with it then let the TA know or uh, you can uh, you can come to office hours we can try and sort it out um, okay so let's see um, so let me finish doing this a little bit uh, so I'm so you just have to, you just have to follow follow the follow the instructions and uh, I think I think you you should it shouldn't have too much trouble so I did add some some things on the data sheet um, so let me bring that back up so one of the things I did add and we'll do this I, I added uh, some extra code if you want to do it uh, for the uh, for the pot so the starter code does not include the pot so if you want to use the pot in the A to D converter like we did in the last lab then we need to add a little bit of code and and so this is the setup code so you have to put this in the so in the setup part so if you see here here's my infinite while loop so somewhere up here I go ahead and I set up my A to D converter right here and I pasted this in here and then you also have to make sure that you've got your the Ansel bits uh, and the Tris bit set to one for both uh, for well for the AN11 RB5 input so then uh, so that's the other thing. So if we do that, uh, add these lines to the clock and pin underscore config function. And I went ahead and also put in these to make sure we turn off the red LED and the blue LED so they're not kind of bugging you. Okay, so then if we, if we go down then to the clock and pin config, it's one of the functions. And I added in these four lines right here. And I think everything else is basically uh, just like the starter code. Uh, except for in the while loop, then let's go back one more time. And then add these lines to the while loop in main to input the pot value and scale its 10-bit value up by 4 bits so that you can compare it 
to the 16-bit uh, da raw data from the timer one. So read in threshold data on the pot, set the go down bit. Now I don't have a time delay here because we never change the channel. So, so the channel is always, always set to be uh, A and 11. And since I never change it, I don't really have to do a delay here because there's enough instructions creating enough delay that it's fine. Then we pull on that bit with this with this uh, while statement. We wait on the go underscore end done. That's the official name. I think you can also call it go done. It works fine. And uh, and anyway, it pulls on this bit. When you set it to a one, then this should be a one until it's cleared. So as long as it's a one, it's going to stay on this instruction. When it's cleared by the hardware, signifying that it has finished the conversion, then you can go uh, read the value in ADRSH and ADRSL. You can sh shift the ADRS ADRSH eight bits to the left, add it to the ADRSL, and then shift the whole mess four bits more to the left, so that you get uh, so that you so that we're effectively getting a 14-bit uh, result, even though our lower four bits would all be zeros. Uh, so you don't really have 14 bits resolution, but you but you then can compare it to your 16-bit timer one result. And we never use up all the timer one because we don't want to overflow. So uh, so that works pretty well. Uh, so you if you add that, then you can actually change the threshold. And so let me show that one more time. Let's see. So um, okay, where is my thing? Oh, here we go. Okay. So we have this. I'm gonna. So I'm going to expand this and switch it over to the thing again. And then I'm going to add in the, um, the output in the, this window here. So we'll set this up over here. Now, um, okay. Now, in this case, it's easy that these things kind of blind you. Uh, what what I want you to see is I, so when I touch the U, it goes it turns off the green light, and when I let go of it, it turns it on. Now I'm going to change the threshold. So watch what happens up here. So I'm going to change the threshold, and I'm going to make the threshold one uh, C. Maybe I'll make it one. Oh, I'm going to make it two two something, two thousand hex. So now when I touch the U. Nothing happens because even I'm draw I'm already below the threshold, so the green light's already off. So I have to turn this down so that I'm so that it's so that it's up below the threshold. So I have to get down here to point where it's gonna where where I'm not starting out with my threshold. Uh, let's see. Sorry, I turned it the wrong way. Okay, so I'll keep turning it the right way. And then eventually you'll see the green light come on when I get below. Okay, now I'm, I'm running right about, so I'm really close, but I'm still a little high. So I'll go down. Ah, now if I get it really close right in here, now look what happens. Uh, It's kind of squirrely now. It's right near the threshold, so it's kind of randomly. And look, if I if I move my hand down here, it's going to stay off. I don't have to touch the button. I just have to get close. In fact, let me let me uh, let me make it just a little bit higher. Sorry. Okay, so something we'll try this. Now now it's pretty much it's mostly on. If but if I put my finger there. Well, it's still higher. I need to go a little bit lower. Okay, I'll do I'll do 15. Okay, now it's on pretty much all the time. Now you can see as I approach the button, I I can just barely touch it. The lightest touch you ever you could ever imagine. Um, my thumbs actually. I don't even quite have to, I have to get pretty close, I, but 
and you can so you can set the sensitivity for a light touch or if I do this now I'm gonna drop it way down oops the other way I don't know which way I'm going yeah nope wrong I want to go this way okay so so I'm gonna put it down about so we know when it's touched so let's see what it is when it's touched when it's touched it's C C81, C70, C60, something like that. So if I put it, if I put it close to that, that's D. So now, now, uh, now if I touch it, I, I have to really mash it with all my thumb to turn it off because I'm, my threshold's too. It's it's not. It's too low. And to get really below that threshold, I really have to make uh, change the capacitance a lot by making a lot of contact with that U. Now I'm not actually touching any of the any of the copper. We're th it's all covered with a with a solder mask, and it's also covered with the, these printed characters. On yours, it's got the white letters. Uh, so it's really covered with a fair amount of paint, uh, and you're not really touching the copper, but you're creating a little capacitive effect. And you're making the capacity go up, you're making the frequency of the RC oscillator go down, and you're dropping the count in timer one. Okay, so what I need is a, I need a little bit higher threshold than that, something right in here. And now with this, I should have pretty robust operation, pretty reliable. I touch it, it goes off, I take my finger away, and I don't really have to mash it hard to get it to turn off. It's pretty good. All right, so that's what you want to shoot for. Now, in theory, when you do all four pads, you could theoretically set a separate threshold for every pad. And you can play with them and see how much different they are. I only have the U hooked up right now, but we're, we're going to have you. You'll, what you'll do is you'll change the channel number uh, in the touch sensing module, and, and you'll do that by making an array of channel numbers and then uh, putting the channel number into the, into the, uh, into the control register setting the control register equal to the uh, channel number. And you can use a for loop and step through them. One, two, three, uh, zero, one, two, three, or you know, basically UTSA, UTSA, UTSA. All right. Um, and then the other thing you're going to do is populate the, uh, the output. Uh, what happens when you uh, detect the U versus, the, versus uh, uh, the T versus the S versus the A. OK. Let's see. I'm going to pop this up. I don't know for some reason it's kind of goofed up there. Okay. Let's talk just a little bit about the test, and then we'll quit. Uh, we're just a little over time. Uh, so uh, I think on... Um, so let me pull up... Uh, shrink this back down. And I'll pull up the website. And I think I have it here. Oh, let's see. Uh... All right, so here we go, and then we'll, we'll do this. All right, so um, so if we look, uh, if we go down here and look, and I think, let me put it in student view. Sometimes I have trouble seeing. So this is what you should be able to see. Um, okay. Uh, So practice test one. So you should be able to look at this practice test one, another test one, prep for test one written. These these should help you. So look at these and uh, and then uh, we'll we'll uh, have this test on Monday. It'll be online um, and it'll be you know it it won't be that hard. So don't freak out about it. But I do want you to just uh, review review what we've covered so far. Um, and uh, you can you can review the chapters in the data sheet. You can look at the at the homework assignments and see what chapters in the data sheet you can you can review, and that should help you. Uh, but but I want you to know the core registers. Uh, I want you to know um, features of, of the of the the microprocessor uh, that it's a hardware machine that it has a separate uh, RAM and a separate uh, 
uh, separate separate program memory and separate data and special function registers. You should know that the program memory is 14 bits wide, has its own address bus. Uh, you don't have to know how many bits the address bus is, but uh, it'll be nice to know that uh, that you can have up to 32K in this family, although we only have 8K on this chip. You should kind of know we have 8K. You should know we have 1K of RAM and that uh, that the, uh, the data memory has 32 banks. Uh, the, the address is, requires 5 bits of bank and 7 bits of where it is in the bank. The 7 bits of where it is in the bank is in the instruction itself, and the 5 bits uh, for the bank is in the BSR, unless you're using indirect addressing. But I'm not going to ask you anything about indirect addressing. You don't even need to know about those registers. You, you do need to know that the programmer's model includes the working register, the W register. It includes the program counter low, the program counter latch high, the 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 uh, uh, status register, and the bank select register. So those are the ones you should know. Um, you should know in the status register, we're concerned primarily with the three bits, really mostly just with the carry bit and the zero bit. There is also a, a digit carry or a half carry bit that is set when you we for certain math operations when you carry from the lower uh, four bits to the upper four bits. Uh, but I'm not going to ask you about that. Um, but that was useful for BCD math. You should know, um, um, let's see, I, I'm going to pull up that one. Where's my thing here? Um, so let's, let's, uh, we'll, we'll do, uh, let's see, uh, so this, this should cover pretty much what you need to know. Okay. Okay, so, um, so if you look at this, you should understand the registers that the processor uses. That's the programmer's model. Understand how the stack works. So remember, it's a 16-level hardware stack. It's pretty much only used to push the return address when you do a function call or a subroutine call in assembly, function call in C, or when you, when you jump to an interrupt. That's what saves the return address. If, you're, if your subroutine does a call, then that saves another address. So that limits your, the depth to which you can nest function calls or subroutine calls, including a possible interrupt call thrown in. Uh, you can never go deeper than 16 levels because on the 17th call, you're going to overwrite the first call. And that's going to screw everything up because there's only 16 places to write. Um, you don't have to do any code. Uh, you should, um, let's see. Um, so you should know the difference between a microcomputer and a microprocessor. Microcomputers have, uh, uh, they have very few onboard modules. They just have very fast processors. They have some onboard cache. Uh, but all of the all of the functions, the the things that drives your screen, uh, that's usually a graphics card. Uh, the your your USB stuff, those are all controlled by different chips. Those are peripheral devices. Your disk drives, those are uh, peripheral devices. Uh, your external memory is external to your to your to the to your uh, microcomputer chip. Uh, you do have a little bit of uh, of of uh, cache on the chip, maybe a level one, level two, maybe even level three. But your main memory is out there on your motherboard uh, in little little uh, uh, SIM cards stuck in. Uh, you have you know a keyboard interface. You have a whole bunch of USB interfaces to it all set up. You have uh, a clock. Uh, you have um, you have a peripheral bus where you can plug in uh, peripheral PCI cards. Um, you don't have any of that in a, in a microprocessor. Uh, a microprocessor, on the other hand, has all its memory on chip. It has its, all its program memory on chip, all its random access memory on chip. And then it has all these modules an A to D module, D to A module, timers, uh, PWM modules. 
It's got all sorts of cap capability just built in. It's got all these GPIO ports. Your microcomputer doesn't have any GPIO ports, but your your microprocessor has a bunch of them. And you can use this chip to do a whole bunch of things. Uh, but you generally aren't going to hook it up to the internet and, well, you might, but uh, you, our little PIC chip is not set up for that, but many micro, uh, many microprocessors are. But, but what you wouldn't have is, say, uh, a display and a keyboard and a mouse and a disk drive. Uh, you wouldn't have all that stuff. And a Bluetooth and I mean, you can have Bluetooth, you can have internet, but usually, uh, usually you just have one or the other. You wouldn't have all, all these features like you have in your desktop or laptop computer. You don't have a CD-ROM drive, you know. But you could add a uh, you could add a little SD uh, drive, or you could even have it set up so you could read a flash drive, maybe even. Um, so the main difference is your your microcontroller is designed to be a standalone and to run one set of firmware probably for most of its lifetime. Maybe there's some field upgrade you could do. But your desktop or your laptop, you're going to change programs with the blink of an eye. You're going to have, you know, a hundred different threads loaded and running. Uh, it's amazing. And just a few applications running, a big operating system controlling it all. Now we do have real-time operating systems that we do run on uh, on, on microprocessors. But uh, but nothing like say Windows or or the Apple iOSs or whatever, uh, much simpler. Okay, um, you should know uh, that when we want to connect a push button to a pin, uh, or sh you should know about GPIO ports. You should know that we can set them for input or output by using the TRIS register, and that what we're really doing is connecting the output of the flip flop associated with that pin to the pin or disconnecting it using the TRIS, the TRIS bit. You should know we have an ANSEL bit that changes it from an analog input to a digital. You should know that when you use the port command, you're reading the pin, but you're writing the flip-flop. When you use the latch command, you're reading and writing the flip-flop. You're not reading, never reading the pin. Uh, you should know that we do have, uh, we can change from SMIT trigger to TTL levels. Uh, although I probably wouldn't ask you that. Uh, but you should know that there are some other things we can change. So the, the level would be one. Weak pull-ups is another. Uh, and, and then you should know that uh, many of the pins are set up to be interrupt pins if you want them to be. Uh, let's see. You should know... Um, You should know that uh, when we drive our LEDs, that we have to have current limiting resistors. That that our uh, onboard RGB LED is set up with a common uh, anode, so it has to be hooked to the to the, the voltage supply, and that's why our pins have to go to ground to turn on the LED, and that we connect them through a current limiting resistor so we don't burn out our RGB LED. Um, you should know that in the push button, we pull it up when it's not pushed to uh, VDD so that it signals a one. And then when you push the button, you ground the pin, you short the pin to ground so that it reads a zero. You, you, should, know, um, you should know a little bit about um, the voltage regulators, that these are linear regulators. They're not real battery friendly uh, because uh, they, they burn up more power than the chip does in most cases, depending if you're, especially if you're running it with nine volts. And you're running the chip at three volts. You're you're burning almost six volts up in the chip, and only three. Uh, uh, sorry, in the in the linear regulator, and only about three volts uh, in your actual chip. So there's so they're very inefficient, but they're but they're nice because they they uh, they give our processor a nice constant voltage, so that it doesn't fluctuate all over the map. Now it, they'll it'll work that way. Um, you should know a little bit about the configuration word. You should know that we're using the internal oscillator. That we're use, that we're turning on the master clear function because we have to have that for our uh, for our snap programmer debugger. You should know uh, that we don't want on the watchdog timer code protect code protect data because those things will cause problems. You should know that uh, that that we do have to have on low voltage programming must be turned on. Uh, 
you should remember that we usually don't turn on uh, the uh, phase lock loop because uh, at 4 megahertz we don't need to use that. Uh, you should know that we have uh, uh, some things about uh, configuring the, uh, the processor clock, that you have lots of selections, uh, and, and you can pick different clock frequencies to run your chip at. Uh, and we just sort of arbitrarily picked one that's kind of a happy medium, that you could run it as fast as 32 megahertz, uh, so that we would then FOS divided by 4, so 32 divided by 4, 8, so there would be uh, there would be eight instructions every microsecond executed. We'd be running it eight. The actual instructions clock would be eight megahertz. FOS divided by four. Um, let's see. Um, so I think that's good. Uh, on the on the integrated development environment, you should know a little bit about that. You should know that uh, that our integrated development environment um, uh, has uh, built-in debug capability. Uh, so you should know that we have what's called source level debugging. You can actually follow your code and see where the processor is executing if you if you compile it and set it up for debug. Um, you should know that you can set breakpoints and watch windows so you can see variables. Uh, and you can actually go in and look at memory on the chip. You can see you can change values on the chip when you have it in when you have it paused. You can uh, you can uh, uh, see what special function registers are changing. Uh, let's see. Um, I think so. Those are the mo those are mostly the things you need to know. Uh, you should know a little bit about. Um, we've talked a little bit about uh, some of the features for a battery operated. Uh, you should know if you're doing battery operated things and. You probably should turn on your your, your brownout uh, uh, sensor uh, so that your chip fails gracefully if the battery goes down and it doesn't uh, fail in a way that might overwrite parts of your program. Um, yeah, I think that covers most of the things that we'll cover in the written, and then you can look at a couple of those other written's and and uh, uh, see what uh, what's in, involved in those. Okay, I think that's it. I'm going to quit now because we're definitely over time.